Oh, there's a monitor. Oh, Jesus. Mm. I can say it's a monitor. Hello, guys, gals, non-binary pals. How's, how's everybody liking Baltimore so far? Mm. Having, taking everything Charm City has to offer? The rats? Smack? <laughs> <laughs> or, or any number of sort of things about where it is. I lived here for like five years, so I love the city. Hence the, uh, the old bay hockey jersey I'm currently wearing. When I heard this was in Baltimore, I was like, oh yeah, there's no way I'm missing this. So anyway, let's get into it. The big green, is it the, oh, the big green. Might be the big green arrow. That's probably the one it goes with, right? So I titled this, <coughs> excuse me, Building a Phosphor G product, uh, forward product strategy ecosystem. But really the title should be, I learned to stop throwing Molotov cocktails and started to get shit done. Hunt, because you know, we're in Baltimore, right? Um, this, is, this is more of a direct, the other one should be, this is, this is actually what it should be titled. Anyway, I'm Todd Barr. I've been in the geospatial industry for 24 years. My knees can tell you that story too. Uh, most of the time I was in the Fed space. I bounced out in 2015. Start working in precision ag, other stuff. Uh, excuse me. Currently, I work for a, the largest insure tech. Um, we serve reinsurers, insurance, auditors, the whole kit caboodle. I was actually supposed to be in a place this week called Baden Baden, which sounds like a side food episode to me, but I'm here instead. Uh, but we do a bunch of uh, catastrophic modeling, climate change, and my title is some muckety muck, like director of geospatial solutions and products or something. Uh, I'm an occasional podcaster, both guest and host. I also lecture at Northeastern University, um, remote sensing, geospatial AI, whatever they want me to teach, really. But moving forward, so this is the trillion dollar, um, $1.7 trillion geospatial ecosystem. As you can see, Verisk is in the upper, like in the midsection. So you can see the Phosphor G logo, right? So directly south of that is Verisk. Uh, you told me 10 years ago I'd be working for the insurance industry, I wouldn't believe you. Because I would love, why? Is that geospatial? It, everything in the insurance is baked into geospatial. If you go back to the founding of insurance with, London, with Lloyds of London back in the 1600s, even the underwriters, well, they weren't underwriters at the time, but they used maps to determine the risk of uh, various cargo ships coming in and out of London. And everything besides really cyber insurance has a, has a geospatial edge. So everyone at my company is geos geospatially aware. They all understand the process and understand the value of the data. So they don't do that sales pitch, they just understand it, right? And it makes my job a lot easier. Moving forward. So about, um, it was still like, it was late August. Daniel and I had a podcast, a uh, matchkeeping podcast, where I basically, this slide deck is an ancillary to that podcast. So if you listen to that, you've already heard this, so you can go ahead and leave if you want to. Um, there's plenty of things to do outside, and the other guy canceled, so you, you know, go get some crabs or whatever. <laughs> um, and recently I had a position open, and I was uh, for a, uh, what was it? It was a product, manage, a product manager, and I got a lot of resumes for project management. So I was like, okay, bear we're gonna need some problems with definition. So, Project management does not equal product management, and product management is not project management. The two are very different, very different skill sets, as much as people think they're similar. Because in product, you don't have any, you don't have any influence over anybody. You don't have any control. You have to work with everyone to make things happen. Work with a number of stakeholders. Work with a number of different different groups and other things. We'll get into that as we go forward in the presentation. But I, I don't have control over my devel uh, the developers I have. That are part of software. I have to work with them. I don't have Gantt charts. I come up with ideas and concepts where I can fit geospatial and different products and solutions. But I can't. I don't. I don't run those projects. At the end of the day, I come up with a concept. We just kind of run through it, and we build viewers, uh, applications, DAS services, wherever we need to build. Like I said but I don't have any control, I just have influence. And I have to leverage, uh, by the way, I did, I, a lot, there's a lot of generative AI uh, imagery in this, in this uh, presentation. The ones with these two keywords, I really shouldn't put on the screen. Just putting it out there. 
Um, but I don't have any actual control. I just have to influence people. I have to be able to talk to people to build a coalition to make sure everybody gets on my side or buys my idea or understands what I'm trying to do. But I have a bunch of stakeholders I have to balance. <coughs> Excuse me. And balancing those stakeholders is difficult at best because they have competing ideas, competing concepts, competing political things. Uh, they want their, their stuff to go forward. So what, I, so what it ends up doing is I have to manage this through what, in game theory, is called positive sum or sum plus, which is a game where there isn't a loser. Everyone wins and everybody gets, not everybody gets 10 points, everybody gets seven. Or three, depending on the game. Or another concept for it is called a growth mindset. Meaning, there's, we're, we don't, we're not dealing with limited resources. We have plenty of resources. We just have to understand that we're not competing for them. And we're just working together to build a product. And this kind of accumulates into a, a theory called co-elevation. That is, um, was sponsored, was, the concept initially came from a gentleman called Keith Fergazi. He's a, uh, a business guy. But if you can dig up his books, I can, I can send you a link to him if you need him. What co-elevation really is, is non-authoritative leadership, where it doesn't matter what your title is. It doesn't matter who you are. You build a coalition of diverse team members, and then you move forward. This is done, it's, there's a lot of work that has to be done on your part to make this happen. Not like emails, that kind of stuff. A lot of internal work. You have to come transparent. You have, to be able, you have to be able to explain yourself. You have to be authentic. If people detect any little bit of inauthenticity, this whole thing can fall apart. Oh, because, you know, I don't trust Todd because they're doing this. Or I don't trust Todd because I feel like they're doing that. But no, they have to be able to trust me and understand that I'm being transparent, I'm being open, and I'm just trying to, right, I'm just trying to raise everybody's boat. I'm not here to build an empire. I'm here to make things work. Because in organizations, influence is basically the big connective tissue that connects everything. Everyone has influence in an organization. And in product, you have to understand that influence and how, I don't know how that plays into everything else. So again, I can't hire or fire people, and at least not people who don't directly report to me, the people I work with. I can only influence them. I can only bring them on board and build a coalition and say, hey, this is what we're going, this is the direction we're going. And being open, transparent, and authentic, that helps build that. And it takes, it took me a long time to get there, but it, you would actually do that, get there. Recently, uh, one, of our, one of our big products that I wasn't really involved in until about the past two months, we're building a geospatial thing to it. And when I got brought in, I missed the meeting because I was going to a hotel, but I, but I was watching the recording and my daughter said, and this is, this is a big deal for me, she said, I've never heard you drop that many F-bombs in 15 minutes. And I was like, oh, because like, the, the contractor was doing all sorts of crazy stuff. And they, they were building a geospatial system from 2002 in 2023. And so I wrote this huge email about how this isn't future proof, this is industry standards, blah, blah, blah. And when my boss, was, and when my boss came to me about it, I'm like, hey, I need to take over this project, or at least part of this product. He's like, are you trying to empire build? I'm like, no, that's not my deal. I'm not here to build an empire. I don't have any turf. I don't have anything to gain. All I'm trying to do is just make things cool and solve our clients' problems. I don't want to, because as you move forward through co-elevation, your title doesn't matter. Your, your title is a byproduct of what you do. And as long as you're approaching people authentically and transparently, the title will come, the raises will come, all this stuff will happen. And then when I first showed up at Verisk, okay, quick segue to another story. I was a usurper. I came in at a director level and I had with zero insurance experience. A lot of it's not so geospatial, not that much insurance. And um, a lot of people didn't trust me out of the gate. Just like, not at all. Everybody thought I was trying to build my own empire. I was trying to be political about stuff. And it took me a solid two years to convince people like, no, I'm just here to get shit done. I'm just here to make our clients happy. I'm here to make you better. And I'm you here to make me better. And we can build this together. I'm not trying to do this alone. I'm trying to do it with you. And some people still don't believe that. They, they, they have an issue with, well, not necessarily with me, but with the whole process of, because um, they they're, they're political people. 
and they don't have a growth mindset. They're not trying to co elevate they're trying to build their empires. Ooh. But going back to product, I have a number of stakeholders I have to balance, right? And balancing the stakeholders is always kind of fun because they all have their things. This person likes this, this person wants that, this person wants this kind of stability, this person, is, this person likes breaking things, this person likes moving fast, this person likes this one company, whatever it is. So as a product person, we kind of deal with personas all the time. So what I've done, excuse me, <coughs> is I come up with the various personas of the stakeholders I deal with. So it's a big red screen, but we have management, consulting, oh, there we go. Sales, tech, large external clients, small internal, small external clients. Each one of these, each one of these individuals, each one of these personas, has their own sort of thing they have to do. They have their wants, their needs, their desires. And in product, I have to understand that, I understand where they're coming from, what they're doing, who they influence, and who they're influenced by. So let's start with management. What does management desire? Initially, a positive quarter, reduced cost. Then they're concerned about employee retention, which kind of feeds into, to, you know, into the, the management and reduced costs. And they really want everyone to come back to the office five days a week for, five, for eight hours. That's their, that's their drive, right? Uh, their pain points. Keeping clients. Clients leave, clients come, client come and go. What's the saying? When you, when you first get a client, when you start losing them, and then also, obviously they want to keep market share. And also another pain point is they don't know what snack will bring you back for five days a week. And they're influenced, both influence id, and, or influenced and influences. They influence everyone in the organization, really, because they can make policy and they can do all sorts of stuff that just drives the rest of the policy for the company. But they're influenced by the big and small clients. So by understanding this, I know who have to, to make management understand the advantages of phosphor G technology, I have to work with the clients so they can influence the manager. Next slide. Consulting services. Their concerns, client satisfaction, client satisfaction, and client satisfaction. Their pain points are client dissatisfaction, and then expanding their own personal footprint, or their footprint, and expense reports, because no one likes doing those, right? But um, the influence, they're, influ they're heavily influenced by management, they influence the technologists, and, and they can influence the clients because they have a direct relationship with them. They're really the point of, con they're, they're the ones who contact with the clients the most. So to go back to the management example, if I have to influence a client, the easiest way to do that is influence our consulting services. By getting their buy-in, I can get a client's buy-in and gain management's buy-in. Moving forward, sales. Uh, what do they want, a vodka martini? that whale or that other whale, uh, you know. But their pain points are messaging. How can they message a non-proprietary software solution to a client? Does it have the support it needs? Is it secure? All that stuff. So that's, that's a gap you have to jump. They're also concerned with retaining clients because they like their sales bonuses. Who doesn't? And they're also really upset by the recent changes in the, in the, in the drink policy for Grub for the, the, the number of drinks per day allowance. They're influenced by management and consulting. They're influenced by the clients and also their finger in the wind once in a while because sometimes you just do things, you're like, where'd that come from? And yeah, it's just, you know, salespeople. Software. So what they desire is caffeine. I mean, who doesn't, right? And they want to work with cool tech and they want their code to compile. Why would this damn comp code compile? Please compile my code. Their pain points are security, software not working with each other, and trying to find that right Baldur's Gate 3 life work balance that everybody's looking for, right? They're influenced by and influence consulting because the consultants come to them for technical solutions or ideas. And then they can influence the consultants that way. They're influenced by management. And kind of by everyone. As a software, as we all know, as a former developer, I know we get kicked around by a lot of, by most people in the organization. Big clients. In my world, this would be your Swiss Re's, your Re-Re's, your Munich Re's, 
assorted other re's, you know, people with billions of dollars of paychecks, right? What they want is market expansion, being on the cutting edge, and then merging with smarter firms, smaller firms, my bad. Their pain points are integrating new tech, software costing too much, and they're not getting free consulting from us because they gave us a million dollars for this one product, but they're not willing to, but we're not willing to help them out with these little things. So it's kind of hit and miss there. But they're influenced by and influence consulting. They influ they're influenced by sales almost directly, and they influence their management. You can kind of see the web starting to form with other people in kind of interacting in your head. Um, I have that as a, as a Miro that I didn't bring into the slide deck, but I do have, are my, my, I have a team floating around. I don't know if they're in the audience because I can't see because these bright lights. But uh, they don't realize that I have a full bio, uh, full battle cards of everyone in the organization about what their influences are and influenced by. Small tech, or small clients. Oh, I burned my eyes out with that one. Um, so they're looking, for, they're looking for market expansion and uh, just being part of the game. Excuse me. And then being purchased by a large firm. Um, their pay points are being left out. Yeah, my, uh, sorry, I got the bright light thing and I can't really read my slides right now. Um, but they're influenced by, it's like similar to the big guys, they're influenced by an influence consulting, they're influenced by sales, and they influence our management system. Now, you have all these ideas, you have all this information about people's political views and or political positioning, right? So what we can do is put them into a matrix. You know, and this is, I mean, this is obviously not quantitative at all, this is pretty much qualitative. So I'm looking for people who support me and who have influence. And the idea is to move those people further to the right. I don't have to move them up, because to me, for, to get people to adopt soft foster G technology, it's not about that, well, if I can make them influence, if I can increase their influence, that's great, but I'm looking for more support. So I gotta move these people to the right. Like the smaller business stuff, they like the concept of foster G technology because they don't have to pay the licensing fees. The big guys on the fence, management doesn't like it because it's unsecure. Um, they're gonna have to hire consultants for, to do Support, uh, technical support for other things. Consulting is on board because they like the idea of just of reducing costs and sales is like eh, kind of on the uh, leaning on the side of uh, leaning on the on the not supporting side because they really don't understand it and how to message it correctly, right? And then tech is to play with cool toys that have uh, that are built on standards and not built on uh, some proprietary information. So my job is to move everybody to the right. So moving people to on the grid. Slowly to the right, further to the right each time they go. It's like a dump. I'd hate to use the, the, the chess metaphor, but I'm going to. Moving them across the board. And I can only do that through influence. I can't order anyone to make this happen. I can't make consulting something and go, hey, open layers is the best thing ever. Or PostGIS is the most wonderful piece of geospatial technology in the world to their clients. I have to encourage them to think that and push, and push them to think that. So with management, Focus on the cost savings, the overall retention, and then how we bring innovative solution, not a solution that the client has seen 17 times from different vendors, but we bring a different solution to the, to the table. We bring something based on standards, not on proprietary information, or proprietary standards. We bring stuff on open standards. We bring things to the table that other, that other, other providers do not bring. With consulting, we, again, we bring imaginative solutions to the client. We can integrate easily with other solutions because we're building open standards, not a proprietary standards. And then, and then we have a reduction of overall licensing cost. Sales guy, he can start, there's a cost reduction. The solutions are innovative and it's flexible. And that's can be, that becomes the sales guy's message. With tech, Retention, again, cool technology, um, flexible AF, right? Speaking in Gen Z language. Um, it just makes things easy for people, easy to integrate. With large clients, you go, you go focus, again, focus on the cost reduction and how it can integrate with their current systems. I was told by a client last year, I don't wanna buy another effing product from you, I want a damned API. Like, okay, understood, sir, thank you very much. And then we can, and we can still like, and then we can tailor the we can tailor the solution to the specific use case. The small guys, same sort of deal. We can tailor the solution. They can interact with it. 
and with the reduction of licensing costs. So, kind of in summary, the key thing, to, the key takeaway from this whole thing is everyone should read the book Co-Elevation or Leading Without Authority, because that really allows you to understand how you can put, how you can influence people with their organizations to assist you to help build strategy, to build that runway and build that landing pad you need to build to change something from a proprietary system into an open source solution. Also, leading with empathy, understanding what people want, understanding, looking at everything from their perspective, not from yourself, but from theirs. You don't have, a, you don't have, a, it's not your empire to build, it's your, it's everybody's empire to build. And understand their needs. Understand what they want, understand exactly what the use cases are, understand how they're gonna be utilizing this technology and, and showing them that this is an improved technology over what they currently have. <coughs> Again, educate, don't preach. It's fine to be a zealot, it's fine to be an advocate, it's fine to be an evangelist. But when you're dealing with the situation, if you become, if you're too dogmatic, you're gonna lose, you're gonna lose the script. It's we and not me. When you start thinking in me terms, that's when things start to fall apart, and that's when things start to not to go. That's when, if your strategic goal is to move to an open source stat stack, if you start thinking as me, you're going to lose the script, and it's not going to happen. And again, it's a long process. Have patience. I've reached the point now where I've kind of pushed it over the mountain after four years in my current position. Um, it's been don't say easy, but it's been a lot of a lot of conversations. Not all, not all of them easy, including conversations with myself, and just how to make this go forward. Um, I found this during the pandemic, but I think this kind of sums it up for kind of my spit on it. In an age of performative cruelty, kindness is punk as fuck. Be punk as fuck. And I so my daughter who is. Far more intelligent than I could ever be. She usually ends her presentations with, you may now leave. I'm like, oh, that's, that's, that's pretty ballsy. But I thought about doing that. But instead, I will leave you a generated eye of photos of Ravens fans dousing themselves in old day. As everyone in Baltimore should do. I appreciate your time. Thank you for coming. Anybody got any questions? Anyone? Bueller? What are your time for questions? How long did it take? What, what time is it, Ryan? That's not bad. That's, five, that's two minutes longer than I had this morning. I have a question. Fire away, Marine. Did a real customer actually request an API? Yes. In real life? Yes. What type of customer was this? Can you imagine what customer was this? So, like all industries, different companies have different levels of, uh, of technical expertise, right? This was a particular insurer out of Hartford, Connecticut. I know that doesn't narrow it down because I spend way too much time in Hartford these days and there's no reason to go to Hartford, Connecticut outside of meetings. Um, we were in a meeting. They have this massive real-time solution and we were trying, and, the, and our sales guys were trying to sell one of our little, our, one of our little doodads. And the guy's like, I want to integrate this technology. I don't want to buy your, I don't want to buy your product. That's what your data. Yeah, insurance is weird like that. Because you'll find people are just like really technically savvy and understand it at like from point gate. And other people are like, I can't tell you how to turn on a computer. So, but yes, I could give you, I'll give you the name later. <laughs> I'm surprised people pay me to do this crap too. So yeah. Anyone else? I can't see anything because of these lights, so I can't see any hands raised. Okay, thanks everybody for your time, and I'll be floating around, and you can find me on social media. Thank you.